اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم Oh, 
ومن خلفهم سدا فأوشيناهم فهم لا Oh, Lord, 
وصلي وسلم وضد وبارك على رسول الله رسول الله وآل الأطهار اللهم صل على محمد وعلى صلوا على محمد وآل محمد جزاك الله خيرا as always respected قاري قل أحمد for that powerful and heart touching recitation of the Quran the only reason we're able to recite these beautiful verses from Allah سبحانه وتعالى is because of the sacrifice of Aba Abdullah al Hussein at Karbala. And the last two chapters recited is about seeking refuge in Allah. When we seek refuge in Allah, we can protect ourselves of the dangers of falling astray, like so many had when they broke their promise to Abi Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam. Inshallah, we can remember these messages and carry them forward across all of the next generations insha'Allah so that we're ready to become amongst the soldiers of our final Imam Ajalallahu ta'ala farajahu sharif Muhammad wa Muhammad Tonight we won't be having a youth speaker there was just some confusion with regards to the exact date so we'll be proceeding to the main lecture from his eminence Sheikh Hamid Waqar please welcome him with three loud salawat ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad A'udhu billahi min ash-shaytani rajim Bismillahi r-Rahman r-Rahim Alhamdulillahi Rabbil Alameen Wa salatu wa salamu ala Sayyidina wa Nabiyyina Abul Qasimi Muhammad Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad Wa ala ahla bayti ya tayyibina tahirin al-masumin As-salamu alaykum everyone As always an honor and a privilege to be here amongst you Insha'Allah we're continuing the lecture series that we have where we're trying to use this time of Muharram, this new year in the Islamic calendar, to re-pledge and rekindle our pledge to Imam Zaman And we've been going over people who were close to Rasulullah and close to the Ahlul Bayt, but faltered. And today we're going to discuss another person. And his name is Bal'am ibn Bahura the son of Bahura. Ever hear of that person before? Yeah. Yeah. He's not a companion of our Prophet, so you probably wouldn't have heard of him in Islamic history, but he is referred to in the Holy Quran. So because he's referred to in the Quran, we realize that this discussion where we're looking at people, recognizing where they fell, and learning from their mistake, is even a Quranic concept, right? So this person, not by name, is mentioned in Surah Araf, so the seventh surah of the Holy Quran, in verses number 175 and 176. So verse number 175 says this, وَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ نَبَعَ الَّذِي أَتَيْنَاهُ عَيَّاتِنَا Relate to them an account of him. So it doesn't mention this person Bal'am by name, just says Al-Ladi, of him. Right? 
to whom we gave our signs, but he cast them off. So Allah gave signs to this person, and he rejected them, he dismissed them. All right? What happened as a result? Or, I didn't read that part, sorry. فَأَنْ سَلَخَ مِنْهَا Is he cast them off? And then what happened as a result? فَتَبْعَهُ shaitan. And then shaitan came towards him. Shaitan tried to deceive him. فَكَانَ مِنَ الْقَاوِينَ And then he became of the perverse. Okay? Then the next verse, Allah uses a parable of a dog, a caliber, referring to this person. And says it's regardless if you come to him or not, the dog's tongue will be, I don't know how you say it in English, but not barking, just his tongue is out. When a dog gets uh, happy or hungry, his dog comes out and he wags his, or his tongue comes out and he wags his tongue a little bit, whatever that's called. So the example is, this person's like that. It doesn't matter if we show him our signs or not, it's going to make no difference. He's going to do the same thing. Right? And that's what we learn from. Is when Allah shows us his signs, we don't dismiss them. So what's the story of this person? Right? <coughs> the story of this person is Bal'am was one of the members of Bani Israel. One of the Mu'mineen of Bani Israel who was close to Nabi Musa Islam, Prophet Moses. And this person was a Zahid, an ascetic. He shunned the world, right? He received a very high spiritual station. He obtained this high spiritual station. It was, it was mentioned that all of his prayers were answered quickly. So whenever he prayed for something, he received it. He was very close to Allah at that point, right? And it said that he had access to the grand name of Allah, the Isma Adam, which if you have access to that, whatever you ask for in this world will be granted to you. So this person was high. What was his relationship with Nabi Musa salam? Whenever Nabi Musa would go out and preach and try to spread the religion of God, Bal'am was with him, and he would accompany him. He would help him in this cause. So not only was he an ascetic, he was a zahid, he was also very close to God, very high spiritual stations, and also very close to the Prophet. So what happened? Right? It's all positive things so far. What happened? So Fir'aun came to him. Right, because Nabi Musa was fighting against Pharaoh, right? So Pharaoh comes to him. Pharaoh, we know, believed in God. He called himself, you know, a God on earth, but he believed in God. He wasn't a disbeliever, right? Pharaoh saw that he's at war with Nabi Musa, alayhi salam. And Nabi Musa has a very close connection to God. Fir'aun recognized this. So he wanted to find a way that he could fight against that. So he saw Bal'am and he said, Bal'am, you also have a close connection to God. Why don't you join my side? And that way, both sides will cancel each other out with this connection to God. Nabi Musa could pray for something, and then you could pray for the opposite. As if that would work, right? As if you get someone to pray to, to Allah opposite to a prophet, as, as if this is a good plan. But regardless, this was his plan. He went to Bel'am. Now, this is where we learn. Bel'am was spiritual, was religious, but he had a price. He had a price which he would sell himself out. Remember the story in Safin? That soldier of Imam Ali Islam who entered the tent of Muawiyah and then Muawiyah was able to find his price, sold out and didn't kill him? 
could have changed the course of history. Imagine what would happen if Muawiyah died in Safin. It would be very hard to imagine that Karbala would have took place. Could have changed history, but he sold out. One moment. So Fir'aun comes to Bal'am and somehow finds his price. Bal'am sells out and joins Fir'aun. Okay? So now Bal'am starts to pray against Nabi Musa a.s. Okay, so he starts to curse Nabi Musa to try to use his relationship with God to attack the wali of Allah on earth. Obviously that didn't work. Right? So he was losing. Now, you all know the story when Nabi Musa a.s. In, in the night took his followers of Bani Israel and escaped from Fir'aun's domain and was running away towards the sea. And then Fir'aun learned of this, gathered his army and started chasing them. You know this story. Nabi Musa reaches the sea, the people complain, Nabi Musa strikes the sea with the, his staff and it splits in two. You know this story, right? What you probably haven't heard is Bal'am was in Fir'aun's army at that, at that time. And he was riding his animal. And this is when, what Allah is referring to in this verse here. He's riding his animal and Allah makes the animal stop. Bal'am hits the animal, a horse or whatever it was, camel, I don't know what it was, but hits the animal, animal doesn't move. Hits the animal, doesn't move. So he gets off, wondering what's happening. Allah gives power to this animal to speak and for Bal'am to understand what, it's, what it says. We have examples where animals and human beings talk. The ants in the Quran. We have Imam Rida alayhi in a hadith. We have examples. But Allah allowed this to take place. And the animal said, are you riding me to fight against the wali of God? I don't want to go. Now this is a sign of Allah. Imagine you're riding a horse, doesn't happen too often these days, right? But imagine somehow you're dr driving a car and the car refuses to go. And it starts to speak to you. And it says, you're going somewhere haram, stop, I'm not going to take you. Right? That would be, you know, if, if it was real and it wasn't like some schizophrenic episode, if it was real, that would be pretty eye-opening, right? That would make you think twice about where you were going and what you were doing. But Bal'am didn't do it for him. He heard the animal. He listened to what happened, didn't change his mind. He kept hitting the animal to keep going, and it said he kept hitting the animal till the animal died. The animal died. Right? And now, because of this, he's mentioned in the Quran, and he's mentioned thousands of years later in a majlis for Abi Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam in a negative way. One moment. He had a second chance. Allah, because of all the worship he did before, gave him a very clear second chance. He rejected it. Go back to the verse. وَتْلُوا عَلَيْهِمْ نَبَأَ Relate to them an account. An account of who? الَّذِي أَتَيْنَاهُ ayatina, The one who we gave him of our signs. The animal spoke to him. Not, there's not much of a clearer sign than that. Right? minha. He rejected it. Discarded this sign. Kept hitting the animal. I still want to go fight Nabi Musa a.s. Right? فَتَبَعُهُ shaitan. And at this point, this is when shaitan pursued him. This is a big, that's a big statement right there. Because the signs of God were given to him. He rejected them. Now it's shaitan's turn. 
So the rejection of the sign, that was from within. That was his own nafs. Right? The rejection from within. But then, once you make that decision, and once you make that move to stand up to the signs of God, then the response is, Allah or shaitan will follow you. Shaitan will pursue you and attack you. And then good luck from there. Right? We all receive the signs of God. Not as clear as that. But I'm sure many times in your life you've recognized and been reminded of Allah. Of Imam Hussein alayhi Of the tragedies and the sacrifices of the Imam. Right? And we can't cast these off. We can't cast them aside. We have to pay attention to them. This is what we could learn. And that's, this is a Quranic example. All the examples we gave on the other nights were examples from history. Obviously this is history too, but this is from the Quran. Right? Please just say salawat ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. All right. So we've been trying to learn about the Islamic position in many different aspects, in many different important issues that this world is facing today. We talked about poverty, and our takeaway was to find a trustworthy charitable cause and decide a percentage of our income to give to that cause, whether it be 1% or 5%, anything small, whatever you want to give, give. Make charity part of your life. As charity was part of the life, thank you, of the Ahlul Bayt salam. So learn from them. Second, we talked about refugees and the plight of refugees throughout the world. And we said the takeaway was to maintain our Islamic identity, even if we're a minority in the place that we're living. Third was the pandemics and COVID. And our takeaway was to remember that we're being tested. And we're always being tested with sickness and health. The next one was mental health. And our takeaway was to speak up and seek help when we need. Right? Don't always just sweep it under the carpet and pretend that it's not there. Because it, if we do that, it might grow and get worse. Next one was disabilities. And our takeaway was taqwa, that the only criterion of value for a human being is taqwa. Doesn't matter your race, doesn't matter your language, doesn't matter your body, doesn't matter your gender, doesn't matter anything. Just taqwa. That's the only thing that differentiates us from each other in, in terms of value. Then we talked about gender equality. And we said that Islam comes before culture. Culture is good, culture is beautiful, but if a cultural practice falls outside of the boundaries of Islam, we reject it. Right? Last night we talked about children's rights, and our takeaway was to create a tranquil environment in our home. And that's something both the parents can do and the children could help out with. So everyone in this room could try. Create a tranquil environment in the home. Today we're going to talk about disinformation. So one of the problems in this modern contemporary world is that information that's received comes from all kinds of sources. And many of these sources are either incorrect because, you know, with good intentions they just don't have the right information or they're intentionally trying to deceive you. And then there's a new ripple when it comes to obtaining information in the contemporary world, and that's the social media algorithms that exist. And not only social media, but the search engines as well. So when you type something into Google and I type something into Google, different results come due to our history. When I, type, when I search something on YouTube, or when I open up my YouTube page, different videos will come up than yours due to our histories, right? And 
social media like Facebook and Twitter and Snapchat and whatever else you have, those are all the same, right? So what's happening is the, these algorithms are skewing the information that we receive to like-minded individuals, right? So whatever we're receiving, we're receiving from people that, you know, who, whatever platform we're using, think is similar to what our interests are. So that we'll stay longer and we're more likely to read and they're more likely to get ad revenue. The danger with that is that we just keep confirming what we're believing because everything that we're receiving is the same thing, just from different, different people saying the same thing over and over again, right? So we, it's more, there's a term called confirmation bias, that's pretty much what's happening, right? Instead of being, being open to reading news, for instance, from different sources to get more of a, you know, full, the full spectrum of opinions, we concentrate on just the ones that, you know, agree with our worldview, right? So, when we look at is when we look at Islam, for instance, right? If you type Shia Islam, you see a whole bunch of um, things about Muharram. Usually, a lot of the blood martyrdom and the the neg negative stuff, right? When you even when it comes to the you know, the um, uprising of Imam Hussein alayhi salam, because a lot of other groups say that it was a political movement, they would get other types of sources. So if someone, someone who reads a lot of material from the other school of thought, or even from Western sources, and they're not Shia, they don't ever read Shia sources, and they type in, you know, Imam Hussein, or Hussein ibn Ali, Right? They'd probably get things that confirm for them that this movement was a political movement. It wasn't, you know, a, a divine sacrifice. Imam Hussein was fighting for power. Right? Which we know is completely wrong. Right? But it really depends where you get your source, where you get your information from. Now, one of the things that they say about Islam in general is that Islam was spread by the sword. I'm sure, have you guys ever heard that term before? A lot of people have, right? This is a popular Western um, thought about Islam. And they say that, look, Islam is an evil religion, a violent religion, a religion that promotes violence. And just look at what the Muslims are doing. And then they refer to the Wahhabis who are doing all kinds of stuff. And just look in this world, you see what's happening. And in this time, in this age, all the way back to when the Prophet was alive. No difference. All the same. Right? Islam spread by Muslim soldiers going to different lands and saying, either become Muslim or you die. Spread by the sword. Right? Now, if you're a Christian, for instance, and, you're, and you say, was Islam spread by the sword, and you, and you Google that, you'll get all the information that would confirm your thought already. But even if we did that, we'd get a lot of information as well, because Google is full of information of this nature, where Islam is attacked, right? But what we need to do is we need to see, is this true? Is Islam that famous picture of an Arab man riding on a horse with a sword and a Quran? In one hand a sword, the other hand a Quran, riding on a horse that the West loves to portray. Is that how Islam was really spread? Is this a true depiction of our religion? Or not? Let's look, let's, let's dig a little bit. We don't have to dig too much even to find this answer, but we'll dig a little, a little bit. Let's first look at the Qur'an. Let's see what religion says. Does religion accept this or not? And I'm not saying fighting, right? But does religion accept forcing people to become Muslim? 
Right? Does the Quran advocate for that? So we have a verse. La ikraha fiddi. Pretty simple. There is no compulsion in religion. A lot of people misuse this verse. A lot of people love to use this verse to say, oh, I don't have to wear hijab. There's no compulsion in religion. I don't have to pray. There's no com I don't, whatever I don't want to do, I don't have to do because there's no compulsion. That's not how we use this verse. This verse is not about akam. This verse, this verse is not about fiqh. This verse is about forcing someone to become Muslim. Are we allowed to force someone to be Muslim? Answer is no. From the Quran, the answer is no. Right? La ikraha fiddin. Kad tabayyina rushdu min Right? Right has become distinct from wrong, basically. Right? Not about ahkam, about the religion in totality. Then we look, at, we look at the Prophet. Wasn't it the Prophet's duty to make people Muslim? Isn't that what the Prophet's here for? The Prophet was sent by God to preach Islam, to make people Muslim. So what, how are we saying, La Akrah Fiddin, you don't have to become Muslim? Even when it comes to the Prophet, right? فَذَكَّرْ إِنَّمَا أَنْتَ مُذَكَّرْ لَسْتَ عَلَيْهِمْ بُمُسَيْتِ Right? When it comes to the Prophet, admonish, remind people, tell people about the religion. But you're only a reminder. Your only duty is to remind. Your duty is not to make them Muslim. Your duty is to introduce Islam to them. Remind them of where they're going wrong. That's your duty. That's it. Right? You're not a task master, which is Musaytir. You're not, you're not, like, it's not your duty to force them to become Muslim. It's your duty to admonish them. That's it. Then you step back. If they accept it, great. If they don't, it's between them and God. You can't force them to become Muslim. What, why would we want someone that's forced to become Muslim? What good does that do for the Muslim Ummah? How is that helpful? Right? Why would God want that? Someone who doesn't believe in their heart but they're forced to become Muslim. Why would God want that? God doesn't want that. He wants sincere mu'mineen, sincere believers like you. Right? So then, okay, the Quran opposes spreading Islam by the sword. Right? But don't we have examples in history where it was? So how does that work? Well, let's look, let's look. We know the Prophet when he was alive, right? He lived in Mecca for the first 13 years of his life. Obviously, no one was forced to become Muslim there. They were attacked. Muslims were attacked. They had no position of power. There was no forcing anyone into Islam. Definitely, definitely not. Then he immigrated and migrated to Medina, to Yathrib. And now he established an Islamic government. Right? In this Islamic government in Medina, some people were Muslim, some people weren't. Did the Prophet come and say, everyone living in Medina, either become Muslim or die? He did not do that. In fact, he did quite the opposite. There were a big group of Jews who lived in Medina at that time, right? People, people who followed the religion of Judaism, Jews. And the Prophet made a treaty with them. They, they entered into an agreement. I'll read part of it, right? Because this is very eye-opening. So this is part of the treaty that was made between the Prophet and the Muslims and the Jews. And think about it spreading Islam by the sword because the Muslims were in power at that time. The Muslims could have easily said, Jews, done. Either you're Muslim or you're dead, or you're Muslim and you, or you're expelled, or they could have easily done that. But instead they made this treaty. And the treaty said this, the Jews who enter into this covenant, into this treaty, 
shall be protected from all insults and vexations. So you can't insult them for their religion. They shall have an equal right as our own people to our assistance in our offices. So whatever governmental help was being provided to people did not matter whether they were Muslim or Jew. Same help was being provided. The Jews of the various branches of Auz and Najjar and Harith and Jashim and Thal'aba and Aus, or probably in Khazraj because Aus probably wasn't written twice, never mind. And all others living in Yathrib. Yathrib was the name of the city before they changed it to Medina to Rasul or Medina. Shall form with the Muslims one nation. So these Jews and Muslims are one. They shall practice their religion as freely as the Muslims. This is the Islamic government. Islam. Practicing Islam in the Islamic government, obviously, no issue. The azan, the aqama, going to the masjid, everything in the street, no hiding your faith, no hiding your religion, everything out in the open. The Jews can practice Judaism as openly as the Muslims according to this covenant. No forcing them to be Muslim. Be your own religion. Follow your own religion. Right? Continues. The clients and allies of the Jews. So not only the Jews themselves, those who the Jews are protecting, those who are allies of the Jews, shall have the same security and freedom. So even beyond the Jews themselves, whoever the Jews are supporting, same. Right? The guilty shall be Pursued and punished. Doesn't matter whether they're Muslim or Jew. If they're guilty of oppressing the other, they'll be punished. The Jew, but the responsibility of the Jews here, the Jews shall join the Muslims in defending Yathrib, which we know that's where they turned away later on in, in history. Right? But this is huge. Right? Because we have the Quran saying there's no compulsion in religion. You can't force someone to become Muslim. O Prophet, who's sent to spread Islam, your job's only to warn people, that's it, nothing else. Your job's not to force them into Islam. You can't do that. You can warn them, that's it. Right? Practice. The Prophet put his, these words into practice in this covenant between him and the Jews when he had power in Medina. It's big, right? Okay. So what about the conquest of Mecca then? Because after the Muslims, you know, established themselves and grew and after a few wars, they went back to Mecca and took Mecca over. I'm not going to go over the whole story. Without the sword, no fighting, walked into Mecca, Mecca became part of the Muslim Ummah. Right? We know some people like the grandfather of Yazid, ex I don't want to say accepted Islam, but became Muslim at that time. Right? When the Prophet came back. Now, did the Prophet come back and say, okay, you guys have been at war against us right now, Muslim or die? No. The Prophet said, you guys have four months. Research Islam. Think. Figure out what you want to do. You want to become Muslim? Great. We accept you. Even though you've been fighting against us. You don't want to, be ex you don't want to become Muslim? It's your choice. But because this is a holy sanctuary, you'd have to leave. Right, so the difference is between Yathrib, is he allowed the Jews to stay? But here in, in Mecca, because Mecca has to be a place for Muslims only, the one place on earth that's like that, if you're not Muslim, you have to go somewhere else and live. But there's no fear of death. No one's going to kill you if you don't become Muslim. Right? So this again, we don't have... Anyone being forced. Some people decided to enter into Islam at that point for their own benefit.
but no one was forced by the sword. Okay, what about after the Prophet? We know the first few Khulafa had expansion movements. What about them? Did they spread Islam by the sword? So we know in the time of Abu Bakr, right? Iraq was taken over. Iraq became Muslim. Then in the time of Omar, Syria, two years later Palestine, two years later Egypt, and five, or sorry, five years later Egypt. So you had Palestine, Syria, and Egypt, and you had two-thirds of Iran as well. And then the last third of Iran in the time of Uthman. All right, so this huge expansion happened. Huge. Was Islam spread by the sword here? This is where the Near Eastern study professors look at. Right? Because during the lifetime of the Prophet, they try to attack the Prophet when, he, when he's coming to Mecca, but they're not successful. But when it comes to these expansion movements, this is where some of them shine light. And the, you know, the anti-Muslim um, people who try to attack Islam, this is where they shine their light. Okay? Now, let's just look at it from a historical perspective and see what's written in the early books of what was then known as Orientalism. Orientalism, has, they've changed the name to Near, uh, Near Eastern Studies. These are people whose job is to academically study the Middle East. Right? The books that I'm going to quote from right here are written by non-Muslims, but prominent academics from that field. Okay? First one, in a book called A History of Islamic Societies by Professor Lapidus. I don't know if I said that word rightly, but that's how it's spelled, Lapidus. And he said this, The question of why people convert to Islam has always gener generated an intense feeling. Earlier generations of European scholars in this field believed that conversions to Islam were made at the point of a sword, that the conquered people were given a choice, convert or die. Right? And this is what people are saying. Islam is spread by the sword. Here's a sword. Say, you believe in the Prophet or I'm going to kill you. We believe. Okay, you're, you're alive. Right? What good is that? Continues, it's now apparent, as we've done more research here, we've looked into it, that conversions by force, while not unknown, was rare. So he's saying, yes, it did happen. It's not as if it never happened. Some people did do that. And we, we know people like Khalid ibn Walid, he did that sometimes. And the Prophet actually, you know, attacked him for that. Right? But we have examples where, yes, some people did do that, and that's wrong. But it's rare. The majority of the cases were not like that. Muslim conquerors ordinarily wish to dominate rather than convert. Most conversions to Islam are voluntary. So when they're expanding the Muslim world, the intention is to rule over these people. Not necessarily to have them all convert to Islam. And this is the mentality of the Khulafa that existed. Right? You remember Muawiyah, the, the father of Yazid. Right? This person who we had, we've been going over the battle of Jamal and afterwards he was trying to deceive Talhan Zubair and all of that. And the battle of Safin where he's fighting against Imam Ali alayhi We've discussed this. Muawiyah went to Kufa, right? Because he took over the Muslim world. And he goes to Kufa and he tells the Kufa, right? That he's not here to care about their religion, basically. I'm only here to rule over you. It's all I care about. Kufa is my domain. Right? This is the mentality of that time, of these people. Right? It's not, we're not doing a 
you know, a mission to try to teach people about the religion. Rather, we're expanding our empire. Right? So ruling over them is more important than converting them. And then there's other books which continue and say even more so. They wanted them to keep their religion so they could easier, easier rule over them. Because if you force them to convert, they're going to have animosity towards you. They're going to rebel against you eventually. Because they're not real mu'mineen. Right? Whereas if you allow them to maintain their religion and you rule over them justly, you could keep them for a longer period of time. Right? So it doesn't make sense to force it by the sword. Right? So just very simply, even though this is something that's echoed throughout so many different pages on Google, Islam is spread by the sword, it's spread by the sword, it's spread by the sword, doesn't mean it's true. Just because we see it somewhere on the internet. We have to take a step back and we have to learn. We have to read. We have to figure out what is it that Islam really says. And with this one is clear. There's no, we can't, there's no convert or die. That doesn't exist. La ikraha fid deen. That's it, very clear. At most we're warners. We're people who admonish one another. Right? That's it. Now, if we think about it today, right, we could learn from that. From that verse about the Prophet, where the Prophet's saying that, or when Allah is describing the Prophet, and, or speaking to the Prophet, and telling him, you're only a warner. That's it. You can't force people we should adopt the same mentality. As Imam Sadiq Islam said, call people towards Islam without your tongues, with your behavior, with your actions, with the way you treat one another and, and treat them. This is what we could learn. Right? And when we think of the examples in Karbala, and we see how the Ahlul Bayt interacted with one another, the companions interacted with one another. We see the love that they had with one another. We see all of this. It's, it's inviting. Right? Just, just learning about these interactions makes you feel like, wow, these people are definitely right. And then on the opposite side, looking what they do. Right? You have children being slaughtered. The brother was talking about Ali Askar yesterday. A three-pronged arrow. Right? Where in humanity did, could that ever make sense? Where can anyone ever justify something like that? Whoever this kid is. Not the son of Imam Hussein. Any infant. Any six-month-old child. On earth. How could you ever justify doing that? Right? You see that side... And you see, these people are disgusting human beings. Lower than animals. Right? People would abhor that. Right? And then you look on the other side and you see angelic human beings, the way they interact with one another. Right? What we take away is that, A, we need to get our information from the correct sources. And B, our behavior should be such that people want to enter Islam. Right? People want to be part of our group. Right? Because they see us like that. I remember, I'll, I'll close with this very brief story and then I'll let Brother Hussein come up. I remember in America, I wasn't in America when 9-11 happened. I was in Lebanon at that time. But when I went back a couple years later, I went back and visited, and there were huge changes to the country, right? Like, when I left to when I came back to visit, it wasn't night and day difference, but I could tell there's a difference. And I asked one of my friends, what was it like, you know, right after 9-11? And he said, look, it was really hard, right? People would look at you, people would make comments when you go to the stores, 
people, because you know, clearly he's Muslim, but people would target him. He said, everybody but my neighbors. I said, why not your neighbors? He said, because for the last 10 years that I've been living on this street, every year in Christmas I give them gifts. I talk to them, I'm nice to them, I'm, you know, I'm friendly. Unfortunately, that's not the norm. Like, even myself, I'm really bad at that. I don't know any of my neighbors. And most people don't know any of their neighbors, right? But if you do take the time to interact positively with the neighbors, right? He said, after 9-11, one of my neighbors came over to my house and said, I hear all this stuff that they're saying about Muslims, but I know it's not true because there's no way you're like that. Right? Just his actions made them say, wait a second here, there's something wrong. Right? And that's what we need to be, inshallah. Please let's open our hearts and inshallah take the journey to Karbala with Brother Hussein. After you recite three loud salawats ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ali Muhammad. As always, Jazakallah Khair, Sheikh Hamid. A'udhu Billahi Minash Shaitan Ar-Rajim Bismillahi Ar-Rahman Ar-Rahim Wala تحسبن الذين قتلوا في سبيل الله أمواتا بل أحياء عند ربهم يرزقون صلوا على محمد وآل محمد In the name of Allah, the most gracious, the most merciful. Assalamu alaikum jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakatuh. As always, amazing points raised by Sheikh Hamid. Those who claim that Imam al Hussein went on a power journey for political gain. There's a great response by a Western academic by the name of Charles Dickens. He mentions that why would Imam al Hussein go to this place for power? If this was the case, why would he bring women and children with him? It makes no sense whatsoever. If you're heading for power, you exclusively take a uh, military force with you, not women and children. This was an uprising against oppression, and these women and children were witnesses and carriers of the legacy of Abi Abdullah al Hussein. That's the mission. And when you mention so many people attacking the religion of Islam, all the disinformation. This is something I've been experiencing for so long, years and years. People taking verses from the Quran in isolation. It's known as contextomy. It's a great deceiving move by these individuals, extremely dishonest. And when you read any of these verses in the Quran and you take into account the surrounding passage, the verses before, the verses after, you can see the majority of them are talking about a defensive situation. Anyway, that's very important to mention. One thing important to highlight, these same critics, you can spin it around back on them. How can they possibly attack the religion of Islam in these situations when Western countries are repeatedly invading Islamic countries against the will of the people? Clean up your own backyard before you attack the religion of Islam. That's a very important point to make. They're throwing stones from a glass house. 
Jazakallah khair as always, Sheikh. Insha'Allah ta'ala, we can remember all of these and try to implement the great lessons of Karbala in our life. No one resembled the Holy Prophet more than one individual who was present at Karbala. His face, his voice, his eloquence, his etiquette, his mannerisms were all a reflection of his great grandfather, the final messenger of Allah Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa alihi wa sallam. This was the son of Abi Abdullah al Hussein alayhi salam, Ali al Akbar, the one whom we commemorate. Ali al Akbar was born in the 33rd year of Hijri in the month of Sha'ban, and he was 27 years old during the time of Ashura, according to the commonly accepted history. It was the time for Fajr and Ali Akbar alayhi salatu wassalam delivered the Adhan Imam al Hussain and the ladies of the Banu Hashim began to cry Tears cascaded down their faces because this would be the last time they would hear the Adhan of Ali Akbar. This was the last time they would hear the sweet melody that was a reflection of their grandfather Rasulullah. During the daytime, Ali al-Akbar comes to Abi Abdullah al Hussein. Like all of the children of Banu Hashim, he begs him for permission to fight. And Imam al Hussein alayhi salam ultimately gives his blessing. Ali Akbar, as he is traveling outside the camp, Imam al Hussein is trailing after him. And Ali Akbar turns around and he asks him, Why? You have given me permission to fight. Why do you trail after me? And Imam al Hussein says, I only wish to see you as much as I can before you die. <laughs> Ali al Akbar faces the enemy soldiers and he says to them, Ana Ali ibn al Hussein ibn Ali. I am Ali, the son of Hussein, the son of Ali. Ali al Akbar charges the enemy ranks like a lion, cutting through them one by one. The history says that he killed 124 soldiers of the enemy. Imam al Hussein sees that Ali Akbar is beginning to struggle. He is beginning to struggle because the thirst of Karbala is getting to him. He turns towards his wife Layla, the mother of Ali Akbar, and, she tell, and he tells her to make a dua. And Layla beseeches Allah, saying that please return my Akbar to me the way Yusuf was returned to Yaqub. At this very moment, Ali al Akbar returns to the camp of Abi Abdullah al Hussein, his father. Ali al Akbar comes to Imam al Hussein. <laughs> Ali al Akbar is falling and he looks to his father, Abi Abdullah. He says to him, The thirst of Karbala is killing me. Imam al Hussein bids his son Ali Akbar to be patient, telling him, Very soon you will receive a cup to drink from your grandfather Muhammad, and you will never be thirsty again. Ali al Akbar returns to his mother. 
her prayers are answered and for the last time she gets to embrace her son Ali Akbar. She cries and she cries at this bittersweet moment knowing that Allah has answered her prayers and Akbar has returned to her but it is for the last time in his life. Ali al-Akbar marches back towards the enemy. He begins to fight. He begins to fight, slaughtering them one after another. His force reinvigorated. His fighting spirit rekindled. He fights them one after another. And the history says that during this second round, he was able to slay over 200 enemy soldiers. But at this moment, Murabin Munqiz, Lanatullah Alay, came upon Ali Akbar. And he said, May the sins of all the Arabs be upon me if I do not kill Ali Akbar and give grief to Abi Abdullah Al Hussein, his father. Murabin Munqiz hurls a spear upon the chest of Ali Akbar and it impales him and it's torn open. Ali Al Akbar falls from his horse. Imam Al Hussein rushes towards the scene and he gathers Ali Akbar within his arms. Imam Al Hussein holds Ali Akbar and, Imam and Ali Al Akbar says to him, this is my grandfather, the Holy Prophet, giving me a cup of water to drink, quenching my thirst. And he is telling me that there is one that is waiting for you. Imam al Hussein is in tears as the soul of Ali Akbar departs from his body and it goes towards the heavens. Imam al Hussein holds the spear. Imam al Hussein is in tears as he holds the spear and he turns towards An Najaf al Ashraf. Father, you lifted the gates of Khaybar, yet you never had to lift a spear from the chest of your own son. Come to Karbala and see me lift the spear from the chest of my son Ali Akbar. Ali Al Akbar is brought back to the camp and the women begin to wail. They are crying and they are crying at the state of his body. Zainab throws herself at Ali Akbar crying over him. Layla throws herself at the sun at the body of our son Ali Akbar. Allah Everyone rise. Ya Hussein, 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 Ya Hussein. Ya Hussein, 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 Please tell, um, I want to be like this. Please tell me when you went away. Mola, tell me what can I say to see you again. Please tell me when would you have my eyes turned 
so long for you my heart yearned I'm going insane I come to you happily under your dome is where I want to be if my eyes don't cry I, then I want to see hear my plea your love has now imprisoned me under your flag is my identity like abyss my love is insanity i don't want to be free tears that tears that flow in my hands i hold them so if i see you it's not working sorry i forgot Ya Hussein, 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 Mola Hakki Mam, Ya Hussein, Ya Hussein, Mola Hakki Mam, Ya Hussein, Ya Hussein. Hussein, ah, Hussein, ah, love is Hussein, ah, Hussein, ah, please tell me. When you went away, Mola, tell me what can I say to see you again? Please tell me when would you have my eyes turned? So long for you, my heart yawned. I'm going insane. I come to you happily under my dome where I want to be. If my eyes don't cry, then I don't want to see. Hear my plea. Your love has now imprisoned me. Under your flag is my identity. Like abyss, my love is insanity. I don't want to be free. Hossein, ah, Hossein, ah, tears that flow in my hands, I hold them so. If I see you where I go, they're yours to take. From the start, crying with a broken heart. But when the horses tore you apart, you did not break. Hands, let my hands, let my heart be your nest. For love is when I my mourn and bite my chest. For the martyred one whose injuries attest from every scar. Love is everything I do when every part of me remembers you. You are the sun and the shining moon and every star. Hussein, ah, Hussein, ah. You are the one holding his martyred son. But what would I have done in your place? Words record, take away my reward. The only thing I ask my Lord is to see your face. Love is when I heard the sign that tells me I'm nearly at your shrine. My tears flow, words cannot define. I'm at your grave. Love is found beneath. Love is found beneath your dome, where broken hearts are welcomed in your home. I would give up all I've ever known to be your slave. Hussein, ah, 
Hussein, ah, Hussein, love is Hussein, ah, Hussein. Allahumma salli ala Muhammad wa ala Muhammad. Um, I would like to request everyone just face uh, the Qibla direction, please, so we can uh, read Zara. Bismillah ar-Rahman ar-Rahim. Assalamu alayka ya Nabi Allah. Assalamu alayka ya Rasul Allah. Assalamu alayka ya Hujjat Allah. Assalamu alayka ya Ba'is al-Hudaw. Assalamu alayka ya Habib Allah. Assalamu alaykum wa rahmatullahi wa barakat. Assalamu alayka ya Abu Abdullah. Assalamu alayka ya Ibn Rasulillah. Assalamu alayka ya Ibn Amir al Mu'minin wa Ibn Sayyid al Wasijin. Assalamu alayka ya Ibn Fatima al Zahra. He Sayyid al Nisa wa Ila al Amin. Assalamu alayka ya Mawlai wa ala ansarika al mustashhadeen ma'aka jami'an wa rahmatullahi wa barakat Assalamu alayka ya gharib al gharabaw Assalamu alayka ya mu'in al zu'fai wa al fuqaraw Assalamu alayka ya mughis al shi'ati wa al zuwari fi yawm al jazaw Assalamu alayka ya anis al nafus Assalamu alayka ya ayyuhal al-madfoon bi-arzitus Assalamu alayka wa ala wa abaika sab'ati wa abnaika al-arba'ati wa rahmatullahi wa barakat Assalamu alayka ya suahib al-asri wa al-zaman al-aman 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 Assalamu alayka ya khalifa al-rahman Assalamu alayka ya imam al-insi wal-jaan Assalamu alayka ya sharik al-Quran Assalamu alayka ya qam al-kufri wa al-tughyan Assalamu alayka ya dafi al-zulmi wa al-udwan Ajal allahu ta'ala furajak Wa sahal allahu ta'ala makhrajak wa zahurak Wa rahmatullahu hi wa barakat Allahumma salli ala muhammadin wa ala muhammad Dua imam zamana بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم اللهم كل وليك الحجة ابن الحسن صلواتك عليه وعلى آبائه في هذه الساعة وفي كل ساعة وعليجا وحافظا وقاعدا وناصرا ودليلا وعينا حتى تسكنه أزكى توعا وتمتعه فيها تبيلا برحمتك يا أرحم الراحمين اللهم صل على محمد وآل محمد Please recite Surah Fatiha for Shuhdai Karbala بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم الحمد لله رب العالمين الرحمن الرحيم مالك يوم الدين إجاك نعبد وإجاك نستعين إهدنا الصراط المستقيم الصراط الذين أنعمت عليهم غير المغضوب عليهم ولا الضالين اللهم صل على محمد وعلى محمد